Yes, I want to move on quickly, so take your seats quickly, please. The next item of business is a stage three debate on motion 11829 in the name of Annabel Ewing on civil litigation expenses in group proceeding Scotland bill. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Annabel Ewing to speak and move the motion. Minister, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open this Stage 3 debate on the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland Bill. And at the outset, I should like to express my thanks, first of all, to all the members of the Justice Committee for their careful consideration of the Bill. And what I, I have noted is that they've all be quite, become quite expert uh, in, and conversant in dealing with a number of very technical civil law provisions, so I commend them for their determination to get to grips with the intricacies of Scots uh, civil Law. I would also like to thank the committee clerks uh, for their uh, extreme hard work. It was a very uh, 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 large bill in one sense in terms of it dealt with, the, with a number of different uh, technical issues. I'd also like to thank all those stakeholders who contributed views and opinions. And above all, I would like to thank Chair Principal James Taylor, not only for conducting a most thorough and detailed review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland, but also for his continued involvement with the bill during its uh, progress through this parliament. I hope that Chair Principal Taylor will now enjoy uh, his uh, retirement and feel very proud of the uh, significant contribution he has made to improving access to justice and civil litigation in Scotland. As I pointed out at the stage one debate, the context of the review was that there has been a continuing 41% decrease in civil litigation in Scotland since 2008-9. That should be a cause for concern for all those with an interest in the health and well-being of Scots civil law as an independent jurisdiction and the ability of our fellow Scots to exercise their legal rights in an affordable way. We know as a result of Sheriff Principal Taylor's review that the potential costs involved in civil court action can deter many people from pursuing legal action even where they have a meritorious claim. The fundamental aspiration of this bill is that those contemplating litigation in the civil court should have more certainty about what it will cost them and that it will be indeed possible for them to access justice. Litigants will be able to take a claim forward on a no-win, no-free basis under damages-based agreements which solicitors will now be able to offer for the first time as opposed to via claims management companies. Success fee agreements including damages-based agreements which are uh, uh, all types of no-win, no-free cases are already very popular since people can understand how they work uh, and, of course, they have a route to a remedy which otherwise may be unaffordable. Litigants do not pay anything in advance and the provider of the legal service will pay for all of the outlays of raising uh, the action, uh, including court fees uh, in, in personal injury cases. In return, the provider of the legal service is entitled to a success fee to be deducted from the damages awarded or agreed, as well as the judicial expenses recoverable from the defender. The level of the success fee will, however, be capped by regulations as recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor, and these will be brought forward for scrutiny by this Parliament under the affirmative procedure. Success fee agreements are offered by claims management companies at present, as I uh, alluded to a moment ago. Though many such companies offer a service that prospective litigants can trust, there has been some concern about the operating practices of some of the other companies. There was therefore widespread consensus that claims management companies should be fully regulated. In parallel to scrutiny of this bill, uh, by legislative consent motion, the Parliament has agreed that claims management companies operating in Scotland will be regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. This has been provided for by the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, which had its Commons report stage on 24 April last week. Also earlier this week, HM Treasury published the draft regulations that will provide for the details of claims management regulation. The Chamber can therefore have confidence that any uh, apparent regulatory gap between the implementation of this bill uh, and full financial conduct author authority regulation will be uh, short. Presiding officer, whereas the first part of the bill is concerned with how much an individual may be liable to pay their own lawyer, part two is concerned with what a litigant might become liable to pay to the other side if the case is lost. This fear was identified in the most recent civil justice statistics for Scotland as being a possible reason for the reduction in litigation in Scotland to which I have already referred. Part two of the bill will therefore introduce qualified one-way cost shifting for personal injury cases. The vast majority of defenders in these actions are well resourced and the majority of pursuers are of limited means. Although as a matter of practice very few claimants are pursued for expenses by successful defenders, there is of course always a risk to a pursuer 
that they may be liable for considerable expenses and possibly bankruptcy if they lose. Chair Principal Taylor's review confirmed uh, this real fear in the minds of potential pursuers uh, and therefore uh, introduced uh, the uh, provision for qualified one week cost shifting, which removes this risk so long as the pursuer and his or her legal team conduct the case appropriately. The test by which the benefit of co-ops can be lost by pursuers owing to their behaviour has been the subject of must, much discussion and refinement at stages two and three. But I am satisfied that the bill, as now finalised, faithfully implements Chair Principal Taylor's uh, recommendations. Part two also makes provision for the potential payment of expenses by third party funders. That is intended to ensure that venture capitalists whose only interest in a case is commercial will be liable to adverse awards of expenses. The Scottish Government, as well as John Finney, brought amendments at stage two to ensure that trade unions and providers of success fee agreements are excluded from this provision. This bill has also been amended to ensure full disclosure of litigants' funding, as Sheriff Principal Taylor identified this as a need to early settlement and thus to enhance the efficiency of the courts. Part three of the bill has been the subject of less uh, focus, uh, although I'm sure a lot of con uh, considerable interest on the part of members, uh, uh, and deals with the issue of auditors of court, and they are to be brought within the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, uh, and also, of course, the final part of the bill uh, uh, has, I'm very pleased to, to uh, say, introduced group proceedings or uh, multi-party class actions for the first time in Scotland. This uh, proposition uh, received broad support uh, in the committee and indeed the view very much was that their introduction to the Civil Law of Scotland was long overdue. The government, uh, as members will recall, has accepted both opt-in and opt-out models and that the reference to uh, both models is on the face of the bill and I pay tenacity in particular to uh, uh, pay tribute to the tenacity in particular of Liam MacArthur and indeed all committee members who absolutely I could see were quite determined from uh, fairly near the outset to ensure that that indeed uh, was uh, the case. Uh, so, presiding officer, uh, finally the bill uh, will provide for post legislative scrutiny to take place in five years time and again uh, uh, those were, uh, that uh, suggestion again I think was very much committee driven. I would have to say that it's not always going to be the case that this would be the best use of resources. We don't want to see a situation where we devote all our resources to post life scrutiny of every single bill, but I think this bill is the kind of bill that actually merits that attention. So, presiding officer, in conclusion, I'm convinced that this will, review will show uh, in due course that the bill has been effective and successful in its objectives of making civil litigation in Scotland more accessible and the cost more predictable to those contemplating seeking to exert their legal rights. Presiding officer, uh, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call Liam Kerr. Six minutes, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the outset, I declare an interest as a practising litigation lawyer, and Parliament should note I hold current practising certificates with law societies of both Scotland and England and Wales. I'm pleased to open for the Scottish Conservatives to speak in favour of passing the Civil Litigation Bill. At the outset, like the Minister, let me thank the Bills team for their assistance throughout the process, in particular for their drafting and support with the many and various amendments which are proposed, and also to the clerks for getting the Bill to this stage. I found the evidence sessions genuinely fascinating. Uh, but they required a great deal of work behind the scenes to ensure we all understood the background uh, and the concepts being explained. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank my colleagues on the committee. I actually felt this was an example of a cross-party committee working really well together to achieve a result that was better than what we started with. And whilst, as I shall elaborate shortly, I was not in favour of some of the amendment decisions taken last Thursday, I am of the view that, for example, the debate on whether to ring fence future losses showed the best of Parliament and the best of the committee. Members heard the evidence, debated it, moved from an initial position, then in response to the evidence and the debate, moved again. Now, it has been a, a long journey from the 2013 Taylor Review to this point, but I think it's a worthwhile one. Back then, Sheriff Principal Taylor concluded that there would often be a David and Goliath relationship which prejudiced the attractiveness and prospects of litigation for those with rights. And therefore, there was a denial of rights, a denial of the principle of access to justice. The Justice Committee agreed, recommending that the general principles of the bill be approved, because as we said at the time, on balance, the committee considers that there are problems with access to justice in respect of civil litigation. So anything which ensures that those with rights are able to avail themselves of those rights must be a good thing. And the bill aims to do this by introducing some of Taylor's recommendations, including the increase in funding options around regulating success fee agreements, the ability to enter 
damages-based agreements. The introduction of quocks, meaning pursuers in personal injury cases will usually not have to pay legal costs if they lose. And the introduction of a class action procedure for the first time in Scotland. So will it achieve those aims? Well, the Law Society of Scotland certainly thinks so, stating in its evidence that the bill had the potential to significantly increase access to justice. And I hope it does. In passing, I, I do worry about whether there has been too easy, too quick a conflation between the phrase access to justice and access to solicitors and the courts. I'm not convinced that these are the same thing. I suggest, as I did during the committee, that the hiring of solicitors and litigating through the courts are a means to achieve whatever justice means to that particular pursuer. Yes, of course. Minister. I note the member's point, but I, I think um, Chair Principal Taylor dealt with that in his review where he, or his evidence where he suggested that actually we should be perhaps considering the phrase access also to negotiation, and I think perhaps that deals with the member's points. Jim Kerr. Uh, I do take the point that the Minister makes. I, I did put exactly the same question to Sheriff Principal Taylor, and he did indeed uh, deal with it. I do think that there's a, a wider philosophical discussion to be had, but this is uh, perhaps not the time to do it uh, on that point. Uh, on that note, I did listen to Daniel Johnson gently suggest at stage two that perhaps the insurance industry might have been uh, too influential and insufficiently questioned in this process. I am paraphrasing, so uh, you'll forgive me. I understand that point. Uh, but I don't accept it as a fair reflection of the considerable scrutiny that I think we all individually and through the committee subjected the witnesses to. And I do think that if that charge sticks, the same suggestion might plausibly be levied at those representations by some in the legal fraternity. For example, we heard last week a great deal about how we shouldn't ring fence future loss because to do so might lead solicitors to wind back from offering damages-based agreements. We'll never know whether that would have been the case or not now, but as I said last week, it does worry me that we reduce any element of what are ultimately future care costs and thus potentially prejudice the amount available to the pursuer for care and support in order to incentivize pursuer solicitors. And I do think that there's a risk that over time the courts will gently and perhaps understandably increase the award to, increase, to ensure the full costs of care are recovered after solicitors have taken their fee. I think that is a realistic possibility, but if I'm wrong, I will be prepared and happy to admit it to this chamber. On the flip side, I was pleased to see Parliament at stage two vote to ensure that the benefit of quarks should be lost where a pursuer has acted fraudulently in connection with the claim or proceedings or makes a fraudulent representation. This is important as there could be unintended consequences arising from a significant increase in court action, such as insurers picking up the cost of more court cases and thinking purely commercially, that would presumably increase overheads and I remain concerned that increased overheads could be loaded onto people's premiums. I feel, therefore, that the full protection against unmeritorious or fraudulent claims that went through at stage two should help present, prevent a rise in such claims. Finally, the implementation of the Act must be closely reviewed to ensure consumers, taxpayers and pursuers don't lose out. I flagged earlier in the process that witnesses from several NHS boards suggested that the anticipated increase in claims for clinical negligence would be difficult to cover with an attendant impact on healthcare delivery, as NHS resources will be taken up defending unsuccessful claims rather than on delivery of services to patients. I think that is a concern, and for the second time referenced the Law Society's contribution, in which they noted it is difficult to gauge the full impact of the bill, as many of the details of the provisions will be made at a later stage through regulations. And to this end, like the Minister, I was pleased that Margaret Mitchell's amendments requiring a five-year report were passed last week. Again, a better outcome as a function of the process. Presiding officer, this bill aims to increase access to justice and through a comprehensive process in which all parties and viewpoints were engaged and debated, we have arrived at a bill that I hope will deliver just that. My colleagues and I shall vote for its passing this evening and look forward to the future that I'm sure it will deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Daniel Johnson to be followed by John Finney. Daniel Johnson, no more than five minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I realise as I get to my feet that many members may be wondering after Thursday's lengthy and detailed uh, Stage 3 amendment debate whether there's anything left to say about the Civil Litigation Bill. Can I assure members that I have plenty left to say and I intend to use my full five minutes. I'm just surprised there's not more members in the chamber here this afternoon. I'm sure they're all watching on their televisions. But the Minister uh, said in her opening remarks that many of us seem to have become experts and very impassioned about this topic. And, and yes, civil litigation is dry and it's technical, but there's a reason why so many of us have become impassioned. It's because 
We hope never, none of us hope to, to, to use uh, uh, your civil litigation proceedings, have to pursue cons compensation in, the, in, the, in this way. But when you do, you really have to. And I think that the, the reality is, is that these proposals will make it easier and more certain for people to bring forward uh, cases. So those people who have experienced catastrophic life changes through injury will have a distinct and very real improvement to their prospects of, of getting redress and compensation. And indeed, I do hope that it uh, addresses the decline in civil litigation cases that the Minister uh, mentioned in uh, her opening remarks. So Scottish Labour fully support this bill and the positive reforms it puts in place. But I too would also just like to record my thanks to Sheriff Principal James Taylor, whose, I think, very balanced and well thought through recommendations are at the, the very heart of, of this bill. And indeed, this marks the concluding stage of what is many years of work for him, with the report having uh, first been published in, in 2013. I too would also just like to add my thanks to the bill team and indeed the clerks, because I think it is their work which has enabled, I think, the very detailed and thorough debate and, and inquiry that has gone on. Now, I know I'm in danger of repeating what other people have, have perhaps said, but I think it is worth just worth remarking on the, on the three, I think, as I see it, key propositions that this uh, bill puts in place. You know, first of all, one-way qualified cost shifting, quarks, which for the uninitiated can sound a little bizarre, but they are hugely important in terms of increasing that certainty, uh, uh, uncertainty that many may have in terms of the cost they may incur. I think it's also very important that we properly enshrine in law that the already popular no win, no fee agreements um, that, that, that so, so that solicitors can offer, the, uh, offer these as well as claims management uh, companies. And I think it's, it's uh, a mark of the, the balance in this bill that the ministers will be able to bring forward secondary legislation to cap these success fees uh, a, a, along with a, a sliding scale so that if there are unintended consequences, they can be addressed. And finally, group proceedings are also a welcome step, especially for those who may have experienced a small loss, who individually may feel that it's not worthwhile bringing forward a case, but acting collectively makes that much more of a possibility. I, I think it's a, a mark of the, the, the seriousness that, that this has been taken with the, the, the thoroughness of the, the stage three amendment de debate that took place. And indeed, I think uh, it's a mark of that debate that I think I uh, ended up being on opposing sides uh, with just about every combination of different parties right the way through that process. And I think that is a mark of how thoroughly everyone approached that. But can I, if I could just briefly set out the ways I think this bill has been genuinely improved. Um, and others have mentioned these, uh, 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 these amendments. I think, first of all, the opt-out from group action, which I think was, was really spearheaded by Liam MacArthur. I think this is a, a very welcome addition. I think it will hugely strengthen the possibility of taking forward group actions. I'd also like to thank John Finney for the collaboration that he and I participated in, in terms of making sure that there were protections uh, for trade unions in the legislation, because it would have been an absurdity that if um, those very bodies which are seek to, to help uh, bring, help people bring forward um, litigation, support them when they experience injury in the workplace, were prevented from doing so. I mean, I would also just like to note, I think that it was important, the amendments that we put through in stage three, in terms of protecting um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, no win, no fee agreements. Um, I, I, and I think Sheriff Principal uh, Taylor's uh, involvement right the way through this process and highlighting the potential dangers of leaving the bill as it had been left in stage two was extremely helpful indeed. Now, I understand and I acknowledge the concerns that many have and have been all highlighted. But again, I think one of the, the important aspects of this bill is that there is the possibility of bringing forward instruments to improve and amend the, uh, fu the, the, the claims against future losses that solicitors can make. But can I finally just say that I really think that the five-year review, again, I think that really brought forward and stewarded by Margaret Mitchell is a, an incredibly important improvement to this bill. And indeed one, while I note that the Minister's caution about overuse of this in the future, I think we should look at where this is a right and proper way to consider legislation in the future to ensure that legislation doesn't have unintended consequences and does have the effect that people propose. So I note the time, presiding officer, so I will conclude there. I think this is a strong bill and I look forward to supporting it this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Can I call John Finney to be followed by Tavish Scott? Four minutes, Mr Finney. Um, 
Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the, the, obviously, the, the legislation is the, the important uh, document, but I often look to the policy memorandum for, for more, perhaps, lay guidance and the policy objectives of the bill. And, and if I just may read that out, the principal policy objective of this bill is to increase access to justice. I hear what my colleague Liam Kerr says about that. I, I think that is a debate for another day. By creating a more accessible, affordable and equitable civil justice system, the Scottish Government aims to make the cost of court action more predictable, increase the funding options for pursuers of civil actions and introduce a greater level of equality to the funding relationship between pursuers and defenders and the personal action, uh, actions. And, and th th that's to satisfy a number of national outcomes, not least uh, national outcome 11 um, on resilient communities, and that's by increasing public confidence in our justice and institu institutions and processes. I think that's, that's very important. It's been referred to as being long-awaited legislation, uh, this, and uh, I certainly am grateful, as many others are, to, to Sheriff Taylor for not only his work on the report, but as the Minister said, his continuing involvement in his wise counsel, which had us all reflect at stage three. And I think that was a maturity of, of how we go ab 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 about dealing with this legislation. And as Daniel Johnson and other colleagues have said, there was a lot of collaborative working. There, there was a genuine effort on the committee's part to um, make um, things better. And I'm grateful as others are to the witnesses, staff, the bull team and indeed the Minister for how we went about that. Now, the Minister said that she understood justice members got to grips with the terms. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll own up and say I, I, I did my very best, but when I do look at this policy the memorandum and I find three pages of got a glossary of terms, well, then the, the one that jumps out uh, is one-way cost-shifting, and that is, as we all know now, a regime under which the defender pays the pursuer's expenses if the action is successful but the pursuer does not pay the opponent's expensive if the action is unsuccessful. Of course, that became quacks, uh, and anyone casually dropping in in a debate must have uh, found that, that very peculiar. Um, but th there's been a lot of support for this bill. There's been uh, support um, from the legal profession out with the legal profession. At the outset, indeed, the, the Law Society said the basic terms are good and will provide certainty, which is the priority for solicitors. Since then, with the combined efforts of the, uh, the committee, improvements were made um, and as is the way a, a lot of effort was made to, to persuade colleagues of some things that didn't weren't successful like for instance the issue on the STUC um, and staff associations on on, on peas uh, on, on fees I beg your pardon the, the deferment of that and and that was about uh, um, whether there would be a frustration on what was referred to as difficult but nonetheless meritorious ca uh, cases but I think the, the bill is improved and it's important it is improved for a number of reasons not least uh, the one which the, the minister again alluded to uh, and rightly uh, flagging up concerns and that was the 41 percent uh, um, drop in the level of civil litigation. Civil litigation is absolutely vital. Um, um, and uh, um, one of the, the uh, as Daniel Johnson um, remarked about the importance of the trade union movement and staff associations, um, from the official report, uh, Patrick Maguire of Thompson Solicitor said, I've absolutely no doubt the provisions that are in the bill will enhance access to just justice. Equally important, it will as, uh, also do what Sheriff Terrible Principle said was his prime um, um, focus and that was redressing the imbalance in the asymmetrical relationship between pursuers of personal injury claims and the extremely large powerful and wealthy insurers and that is that level playing field that we're all keen to bring about um, I could say a lot more but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and say that the Scottish Green Party will be supporting the, the bill at decision time tonight thank you thank you very much Mr Finney Tavis Scott to be followed by Rona Mackay Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start with an apology on behalf of Liam MacArthur? His tenacity did not extend to being here today um, because he's, uh, because, and it says here, uh, he's in an important engagement in his constituency, which I think means he's opening something, but I can't remember what it was or is, uh, and he's been unable uh, due to, uh, to get down this afternoon. Um, Logan Air schedules achieve many things, but not um, whisking one to Edinburgh uh, in time for uh, four o'clock on, uh, on a Tuesday afternoon. He'd certainly wish me to pass on his thanks to committee colleagues, the clerk, Spice, 
uh, and of course those who gave evidence to the Justice Committee, indeed the Minister and her colleagues, for uh, the work that has been taken forward in uh, this bill. Uh, may I also uh, pay particular tribute to Sheriff Principal James Taylor for his work in laying the foundations for this legislation, uh, as he made clear to the committee the recommendations in his report back in 2013 were about improving access to justice uh, through addressing the expense and funding of civil litigation uh, in Scotland. And this bill does that in a no number of important ways, and it's why our benches will be happy to support uh, the bill at uh, decision time uh, this evening. One or two uh, brief uh, observations. Uh, now, unlike colleagues uh, in this committee, I have not the benefit of having lived and breathed qualified one-way cost shifting over recent months. Uh, I'm taken with Daniel Johnson's pronunciation, uh, masterful pronunciation of the shorthand mm -hmm. of that, which I'm certainly not going to attempt. Uh, but I do recognise that uh, that indeed is the centrepiece of the changes set to be introduced uh, through this bill and was at the heart of the problem identified by Sheriff Principal Taylor, namely that a lack of certainty about the likely costs involved in bringing a case and the prospect of having to bear the legal costs of a defendant can be a sufficient deterrent. Can I say that's one of the few occasions when I've read my own speech and actually learned something uh, during the course of the last couple of minutes. Uh, I also recognise the concerns have arisen in relation to the risk of creating a so-called compensation culture. However, the regulation of claims management companies in Scotland being taken forward through regulation elsewhere will help to address some of those fears. Uh, meanwhile, perhaps the issue that aroused most debate last week, I certainly recognise this from last week's stage two, was the question of whether or not damages for future loss should be ring-fenced from any success fee. I appreciate the inherent sensitivities. Uh, no one would wish to see those individuals who have suffered the most grievous loss or harm facing mm -hmm. a prospect or not, of not receiving the full amount of compensation awarded uh, to them. But on balance, uh, the Scottish Liberal Democrats are persuaded that in ring-fencing any lump sum damages, we run the risk of diminishing the chances of cases being taken on. And as a consequence, we would reduce the prospect of individuals accessing the justice they so desperately need and richly uh, deserve. Finally, let me make mention of the Bill's proposals in relation to group proceedings. As with damage-based agreements, the Bill's introduction of group proceedings into Scots law is welcome and reinforces its overarching objective of improving access to justice. Uh, while the Government was initially only minded to allow for an opt-in approach, I'm pleased that the Committee backed uh, Liam MacArthur's amendment to put opt-out on the face of the Bill as well, and I'm grateful for colleagues' observations on Liam's work in this area. Now, obviously, that will take a little longer to introduce, but having this option available is essential if we were to deal with breaches of consumer law. Invariably, the, these uh, will have a relatively small impact on a large number of people, so the cumulative impact is high, but the incentive for any one individual to, to participate in court action is low. Mm. Thanks to the efforts of which and the amendments successfully brought forward by Liam MacArthur at an earlier stage, we now have been th that offers the prospect of access to justice in these cases as well. Presiding officer, there's a lot more I could obviously say about QOCS, but in the interests of brevity and lack of knowledge, I'll leave it there. Save to confirm that we will be very happy to support this bill at decision time shortly. Thank you very much. And I now call Runa Mackay to be followed by Gordon Linders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Access to justice is the hallmark of a civilised society and is at the heart of the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. Last Thursday, the Stage 3 amendments were, for the most part, passed consensually, and I believe the changes made since Stage 2 have strengthened the Bill and eradicated possible loopholes. As Deputy Convener of the Justice Committee, I too would like to thank all our stakeholders who gave evidence and the excellent work of the clerks who did a great job of simplifying the key points of the bill to help the committee's understanding. Presiding officer, this bill will create a more affordable and equitable civil justice system. How many times have we heard of people being put off bringing an action because they say they can't afford it? As the Minister said, there's been a 41% decrease in civil litigation cases since 2008 and despite the Justice Committee hearing conflicting views from witnesses on this, I believe this proves that there, there has been a problem. Now the costs involved in civil litigation will be more predictable and therefore provide that crucial access to justice. The Bill provides the legal framework to implement a number of key recommendations of Sheriff Principal Taylor's balanced review of expenses and funding of civil litigation published in 2013. And while it may seem a little technical, and as Daniel Johnson said, dry, 
The bill will have significant impact on the public and anyone getting involved in civil litigation, the background to which is usually a stressful situation. Approximately half the recommendations do not require primary legislation and will mostly be implemented by rules of court to be drafted by the Scottish Civil Justice Council, while those regarding sanction for counsel and personal inju injury actions were provided for in the Courts Reform Scotland Act. The other recommendations require primary le legislation and most will be implemented through this bill. The main exceptions are, as we heard, the regulation of the claims management industry and referral fees which will be subject to forthcoming legislation. Specifically, the bill in includes provisions for Scottish ministers to introduce caps for success fee agreements, commonly known as no win, no fee, speculative fee agreements and damage-based agreements in personal injury and other civil actions, and will allow, allow solicitors to use DBAs in Scotland. It also introduces quacks, as we've heard, when a pursuer is not liable for the defender's expenses if they lose, but can still claim their own expenses from the defender if they win. This would apply in personal injury cases and appeals, including clinical, clinical negligence, for example. It will also allow for new court rules in respect of third party and pro bono funded litigation and for legal representatives to bear the cost where their conduct in a civil action has caused needless cost. It also enables the auditor of the court of session and sheriff court auditors to become salaried posts within the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and to allow for the introduction of a group procedure in Scotland. Presiding officer, the group procedure element is a, mo is a most important part of the bill being introduced for the first time in Scotland and the Justice Committee welcomes this. The Scottish Government have been persuaded that both an opt-in and opt-out style, uh, an opt-in and opt-out system um, is the best way forward. And I believe this is an improvement on the stage two position. It's also a clear example of how consensual this bill has been. And as all factors have been carefully considered, as my colleague Liam, Car Liam Kerr stressed. One of the other aspects of the bill is that litig litigants will now be aware of every funding option in as clear, as comprehensive a way as possible, which again will will uh, improve access to justice. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I believe this bill will facilitate access to justice, create a more affordable and equitable civil justice system. And for these very important reasons, I'm happy to support the passing of stage three onto the statute books. Thank you. And I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Mary Fee. Presiding officer, I would open by referring to my entry in the register of interests as a practicing advocate. The stated aim of this legislation is greater access to justice in civil cases, and who could disagree with such a proposition? Quarks is the tool through which that access is to be opened up, but getting the balance right, perhaps a bit like getting the pronunciation of that right, um, is slightly more difficult. We want to see that unmeritorious claims do not spiral out of control, and I think that's one of the main concerns of the possible effects of this bill. Indeed, it is questionable whether allowing actions to be brought without a party having to weigh up that most important factor in litigation, court expenses, is even in principle a good idea. As those involved in litigation know all too well, cases may sometimes be settled on grounds little related to their merit, simply due to spiraling costs of an action. And the wording of this bill, debated in this chamber last week, is important. But at least the fraud test has been strengthened rather than diluted. Equally important, however, is that an assessment of the number of unmeritorious claims is made in the future to enable an accurate assessment on the impact on justice for everyone that follows as a result of this bill. For this to happen, a variety of accurate information will require to be gathered and collated. I would suggest some of the things that need to be looked at, the number of cases settled without proof, the number taken to a full hearing but unsuccessful, and so on. For it is critical that justice should be properly served. And if damages for ring future loss are not to be ring-fenced, then this will require a particularly careful review in due course. Now, strong evidence-based arguments were made on both sides during the consideration of this bill. There are real concerns from insurers that high-value claims could lead to significant sums for critical care and support later in life being lost. We heard from my colleague, Margaret Mitchell, 
that a simple comparison with what has gone before in other parts of the UK does not take into account differences from the Scottish system. Presiding officer, measuring the success or failure of the decisions taken in this chamber should be an important part of the policy making process. We would be meant to be here to make people's lives better, and that must include ensuring that unintended consequences do not produce a different result than expected. And that is why the part of the bill that allows for review is so important, so that this bill can be assessed in future as to whether it has increased access to justice for the people who need it, and whether indeed they have been fairly compensated when they have done so. Finally, the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill from the UK Parliament will, as members will be aware, regulate claims management companies, including the use of cold calling, which everyone here will be familiar with. Um, the frustrating practices uh, carried out by certain companies. And I'm pleased the Scottish Government has finally agreed to the UK Government's standards on this issue. But as colleagues will know from stage two, I would like to have seen the Civil Litigation Bill delayed until that legislation comes into force. Concluding on that point, I hope that regulatory void created by the other parties in this Parliament does not lead to negative consequences for the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you very much. And I call on Mary Fee to be followed by Mary Goujon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. And during the, the early stages of this legislation, I was a member of the Justice Committee and heard evidence from a range of individuals during the early evidence sessions. And I'd like to take this opportunity to commend the current members of the Justice Committee and the committee clerks for all their work with this bill throughout the legislative process. And this bill will remove the considerable uncertainty around the legal costs of civil litigation and will work to redress the notable imbalance that has existed between individual litigants, including those supported by their trade unions and large insurance firms. And Scottish Labour support both the core principle of the Civil Litigation Bill to widen access to justice and is supportive of the numerous detailed sections of the bill which have been strengthened by amendments both at stage two and at stage three. And at stage two, the most significant amendments dealt with section 10 of the bill. And the amendments to section 10 were crucial, clarifying the wording of this section to make it explicitly clear that the power to award expenses against third party funders does not apply to trade union funded litigation. And in addition to the stage two amendments, further amendments to the bill were agreed last week in the chamber at stage three. And presiding officer, I was pleased that there was cross party support from the Greens, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP for the Scottish Labour amendments in the name of my colleague, Daniel Johnson, which served to provide a guarantee and a protection for no win, no fee legal cases. And it is important to note that without the Scottish Labour amendments, the Civil Litigation Bill potentially could have severely limited access to damage-based agreements for accident victims, including in high-value cases, which regularly involve individuals who have suffered very serious injury at work. And the bill in its current amended form protects the legal rights of individuals who have experienced serious injury in the workplace to pursue a fair and a just compensation settlement without any concern or fear of being burdened with sometimes quite significant financial debt. And the Scottish Labour amendments to the Civil Litigation Bill, both at stage two and at stage three, have been vitally important in ensuring that the bill upholds its fundamental principle of improving and widening access to justice. And in coming to a close, presiding officer, I do think that the Civil Litigation Bill is a vitally important piece of legislation. And it does serve a strategic purpose 
and will have a positive impact on thousands of individuals in Scotland annually who become involved in civil litigation by firstly helping to redress the imbalance between individual litigants and secondly by providing a cast iron guarantee and a protection for the status of no win, no fee legal cases. And I, along with my colleagues in these benches, will be happy to support this bill at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Mary Goujon before we move to Daniel Johnson with the first of the closing speeches. Mary Goujon. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, well, I think the Minister was being very kind to us earlier, claiming that we're all experts on this now, because it has been very difficult subject matter to, to get our heads around. And I know that Tavish Scott passed on Liam MacArthur's thanks uh, to the committee clerks and other members on the committee. And I'm sure Tavish passed on his own thanks to Liam MacArthur for allowing him to take part in this debate. Though you can tell he's relatively new to it since he hasn't quite got his head around the, the fancy acronyms that we have uh, and how to articulate them. But this bill is vitally important and Daniel Johnson highlighted some of the reasons as to why that is because at its heart it is about widening access to justice and today I intend to focus on two elements of the bill that I believe uh, have done that and that's the introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting or quocks as we've heard a lot about already this afternoon and group proceedings. Now, in terms of quocks, it essentially removes any financial risk to the pursuer bringing forward a claim, even if they're unsuccessful. And this was an area I find particularly interesting in committee because I think what initially had concerned me were the cases brought forward where a defender was an individual as opposed to a large insured firm or organisation. Because I, I suppose I initially thought, was it fair to expect them to foot the cost of litigation even if they were successful in defending a claim brought against them? Uh, there was also a fear that if this was introduced, it would lead to a rise in spurious claims. Now, at stage two, we considered amendments that would impose certain restrictions on who should be able to benefit from quarks, such as an amendment which would provide protection for defenders who are uninsured, but remove protection for third party funders. However, there was concern, as was rightly pointed out by Liam MacArthur during the committee consideration, that this would provide an incentive for people not to take out insurance so that they could then escape that liability. And this concern was also raised by Sheriff Principal Taylor during our evidence sessions when he stated, you could, you could end up with parties not bothering to insure themselves when they ought to, or with parties taking on a much higher excess in order to pay a much lower premium and thereby making themselves uh, self-insured. And it was also important to note that Quox is in operation elsewhere. Sheriff Principal Taylor also went on to say during our committee session, we can look to England and Wales where the rules of court are the same as what is proposed here to find out what has happened there. We've heard of no difficulties with qualified one-way cost shifting being operated, operated as it is proposed to be operated here. And I think it is important that a balance is struck that ensures that there is fairness and that access to justice is delivered. And I believe that with the current amended proposals relating to Quox from stage three, I believe that we now have that in place. Now, the bill also uh, will see group proceedings being introduced for the first time, uh, a move which has been widely welcomed by insurers, unions and law firms. The main contention in the debate has been whether the system should be an opt-out system as originally proposed by the Scottish Government or an opt-out system. The consumer group which, who were in favour of an opt-out system where, after the claim has been won and the defender has been ordered to pay compensation, affected consumers can come forward and claim the proportion of the compensation that is rightfully theirs. That, they felt, removed the administrative burden of gathering together affected consumers before proceedings are commenced, when the incentive is low for consumers to get involved because the outcome of the action is uncertain. Now, during our con uh, discussions at the committee, one concern raised was that the opt-out mechanism may take a considerable time to put into practice. Uh, Paul Brown from the Legal Services Agency stated that it has taken an inordinate, uh, or inordinate amount of time to get where we are, and it would be a pity if one went for the most ambitious arrangement, and that resulted in further delay. But I think, again, at stage three, we've managed to strike the correct balance where it's at the discretion of the court which system will be used, whether that's opt-in, opt-out, or the, the choice of either. Now, as I said at the beginning, this bill is about increasing access to justice, and I believe that through the committee's consideration and all the different stages of the bill and the consequent amendments made, I think we've got the balance just about right, and I would gladly support this today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches, and I call on Daniel Johnson to conclude for the Labour Party. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, I, I think very, this debate has continued very much the, the theme uh, that, that, that the whole of this bill has proceeded with, in which is a degree of engaged um, discussion uh, around some items which are very technical and potentially dry in nature. So I, I mean, I'd like to thank, uh, to begin with, um, uh, uh, Mary Fee and, and others in terms of just acknowledging the, the broad uh, sweep of the committee's work. I think the committee has done an excellent job and I'd like to thank uh, my, my fellow members. I very much uh, took up on this uh, about halfway through after they concluded their, their stage one uh, uh, consideration of the bill at stage two. So I thank everyone for doing that. Indeed, I, I thought in some ways that the debate was best summed up by, by Mary Goujon in, in her speech just there. While she opened up by sort of pretending that, are, that none of us are experts. I think she uh, gave the game away by giving actually a very comprehensive speech, going through not just I think some of the technical details and why they're important, but also I think I think uh, expressing a degree of the balance that both the original proposal sought to strike and actually that balance that we sought to strike right the way through this process as a committee. So I'd, I'd like to thank her for her contribution. I would just like to touch on, on the, the contribution by uh, Liam Kerr, because I think he, he, he brought up some ongoing concerns, both in terms of the specifics of, of the, the bill, but also, I think, some of the general points. And I think the point around um, access to justice not uh, being the same thing as access to courts and solicitors is a point that's well made. I think sometimes we can, I think, uh, 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 lead to a, a conclusion where we... we, 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 we I think blur the distinctions between these two things, and they're not one and the same. But I think this, this bill uh, broadly gets that balance right. I think the Minister pointed out some uh, uh, proposals from Sheriff James, uh, Principal James Taylor, which sought to strike that balance. But I think it is a point and a principle that we should continue to uphold and examine and challenge ourselves with. And indeed, I would also go further, while I think this is a, a step forward in terms of access to justice, I think it will improve people's ability to bring forward cases. It's certainly not the last word in access to justice. And I think one of the things is we have been able to strike a balance between the, the, the awards that people might be able to achieve through court and, and offset the costs against those. Now, there's a, a broad range of different actions one might be able to bring to court or indeed actions one might be involved at a court where simply that sort of mechanism isn't available. And it is an ongoing concern, certainly of mine and more broadly of, of uh, these benches, the Scottish Labour benches, that, that justice is increasingly becoming an issue or, or something that you can access if you can afford it. Now, I think that's something that we must continue to examine thoroughly and, and challenge robustly. Um, I would just also like to just deal with uh, some of Gordon Lindhurst's points, because I think we do have, and I think, an important opportunity. There's an important mechanism in terms of the five-year review. And I think he, I think, very fairly, I think, identified some of the things that do need to be tested and challenged at that point. We do need, I think, very clear assessment about what is happening in terms of the numbers of cases and how they're concluding and how this bill is actually, or actually operating once it's an act. There may well be unintended consequences, and I think it's important that, that we, we, we capture these. And I would include future losses, and I recognise that, that, that there's not uncontroversial in terms of the changes that were made at stage three, and it is important that we challenge that there are not unintended consequences. But there are also other things that I would like to uh, suggest do get examined at stage three, um, in, including the, the, the fraud uh, arrangements. Now, it's obvious that we must prevent fraudulent actions from receiving the benefit of quarks, but I think the arguments made by the STUC and others about over-egging uh, uh, and the possibility that that could uh, lead to people losing quarks unfairly, I think, again, that is something that needs to be looked at, whether or not that is happening, whether that's an unintended consequence. And I know, likewise, I, I, I made amendments both at stage two and stage three about pay-as-you-go arrangements. And, and I think the, the, the issues that are faced by trade unions in terms of funding uh, court actions as they proceed, again, I would very much like that to be examined uh, at the five-year review. And finally, I think that, the, 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 and I've raised it before, the, the question of whether environmental cases could be included uh, within these actions, especially group actions. I think that there are good reasons why that should be examined. So uh, in, in, in closing, I think this has been a very good debate. I think it has been 
uh, proceeded in the manner in which this bill has uh, proceeded right the way through this place. I think we should all feel very pleased with the end result. I think this is a good bit of legislation. I look forward to voting on it. Uh, the one thing I would say, I think I'm very disappointed to be concluding this debate without hearing Tavish Scott say the word quacks. Um, but that's my only regret this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Margaret Mitchell to conclude for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill is complex and, as Daniel Johnson stated, very technical. Based on the Taylor Review and the previous Gill Review recommendations, the Bill seeks to address a David and Goliath scenario whereby there is an imbalance in the relationship between pursuer and defenders. The former tend to be individuals with little experience of the legal system who have limited resources. The latter tend to be insurance bodies or large companies who have substantial resources. The legislation therefore makes provision to reject this imbalance by introducing qualified one-way cost shifting, which overturns the established principle of loser pays the expenses of the winning side. The bill also allows group proceedings or multi-party actions to be brought in Scotland for the first time through an opt-in process. And prompted by evidence from the UK's largest consumer organisation, which, who argued for the introduction of an opt-out mechanism to be included alongside the in, uh, opt-in provision, an amendment to this effect was lodged by Liam MacArthur and passed at stage two. Stage two amendments were uh, also lodged to permit the Scottish Civil Justice Council to develop the rules for both opt-in and opt-out procedures and crucially both of these procedures are now in the face of the bill. The legislation allows for the damage-based agreements to be enforced as part of a success fee agreements and this means that solicitors can claim a percentage of the compensation awarded to their client if the case is won. As Liam Kerr pointed out, the future loss provision has been one of the most contentious in the bill and has raised concerns from the outset. But let's be clear, future loss can include money awarded to an injured pursuer specifically to cover, for example, essential and expensive medical equipment and the cost of future care. Here, witnesses' evidence was diamet diametrically opposed. Personal injury lawyers argued for future loss to be included as part of lawyers' fees, and insurance company representatives, as well as um, the EHRC, argue for, argued for it to be protected by ring fencing. The committee considered both sides of the argument and ultimately decided at stage two to ring fence the future loss element so that it cannot be claimed as part of the lawyer's fees. However, <clears throat> the, uh, following this stage two decision, Sheriff Principal Taylor wrote to the committee outlining his personal concerns and opposition to this approach and consequently the decision to ring face was reversed at stage three. Having carefully considered Sheriff Principal's letter, I remain unconvinced by his arguments, I have to say. For example, he cites the effect of ring fencing future loss in England and Wales meant that it was not worth solicitors taking on these cases. However, this fails to recognise that the situation in Scotland is very different. Scottish solicitors, unlike their counterparts in England and Wales, can enter into DBAs claim a percentage of their fees from a lump sum settlement and can, in addition, also be awarded judicial expenses for all their outlays and costs with the possibility of an additional uplift for complex cases. In other words, I still maintain the comparison is not analogous. Amendments at stage two require, to require lawyers to be open and transparent about the future loss element in settled claims were lodged, and I'm disappointed these amendments were rejected. Finally, presiding officer, the post-legislative scrutiny of this bill, which may have as yet unintended consequences, is crucial, given some of the controversial provisions. And I thank the Minister for improving my um, stage uh, two amendment here. I also thank all those who gave evidence, either written or oral, and in particular, I thank my fellow committee members, the Bill team, and pay tribute to the stalwart work of the Justice Committee clerks 
in helping the committee scrutinise this legislation which seeks to increase access to justice for individual consumers and the general pub public in pursuing civil litigation cases. And the Scottish Conservatives will be pleased to support the bill this evening. Thank you very much. And I call on Minister Annabel Ewing to conclude our debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, have, uh, I would uh, refer members to my uh, reference to the uh, register of interest that I actually made at the beginning of the stage three amendment stage. So I hope that that carries forth to, to this part of the debate. I've listened with interest to the various contributions made uh, during this last part of the consideration of this bill this afternoon. And I do very much welcome the support expressed right across the chamber for this bill. Uh, and uh, in closing my uh, remarks on the bill, I, I would like to make a, a few comments, picking up a few issues. Uh, on a bill which will indeed improve access to civil justice in Scotland, including, therefore, access to the possibility of negotiating a settlement. Uh, section 4 on the issue of uh, caps and success fees is an important one, and it's important to remind the Chamber that the Government will be bringing forward draft regulations on caps on success fees under the affirmative procedure. The current intention is to follow the caps recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor, which he felt permitted solicitors and claims management companies a reasonable return. Uh, further to the work and outlays involved in the pursuit of individual claims under success fee agreements. Uh, he felt his proposals represented a carefully considered balance uh, uh, of the, the needs of the individuals and the incentivisation of uh, their legal uh, advisers. And uh, as he indicated, an individual was much more likely to welcome 80 to 85 per cent of their damages rather than 100 per cent of nothing if they cannot pursue the claim because they have no other means of funding. And it should be borne in mind with regard to the sliding cap on success fees that the caps are maxima and there will be competition amongst providers uh, to uh, drive down deductions in practice. Uh, uh, in terms of the issue of having to pay more than one success fee, whilst practitioners were quite clear that this could not be the case, amendments to the bill at stage two have made this clear and put it beyond uh, doubt. On the very important issue of the future loss element of damages, we of course had a very good debate on that subject at the stage three amendment stage just last Thursday. And in light of the concerns raised at stage two, I and other members were happy to support Daniel Johnson's stage three amendment, which means that future loss in cases where there is uh, where the award is paid as a lump sum is not uh, ring fenced, subject, of course, to certain uh, very important safeguards set forth in the bill itself. As I said on intervention to Liam Kerr during earlier stages of the consideration of this bill, uh, there is no evidence uh, that leads to, to, to suggest that this will lead to inflationary uh, damages awards. Judge make, uh, judges make awards according to the law as it actually stands. And I think Chair Principal Taylor suggested that the chance of this direct correlation was uh, zero. Would uh, members please keep the noise down, please? The issue of uh, quarks, which uh, I, I still think we should hear Tavish uh, Scott uh, pronounce at some stage. He can always intervene me. But on the important issue of uh, quarks, I do not believe uh, that this will lead to unmeritorious claims, as has been suggested by some. And there are a number of important factors which will act to discourage spurious court actions. First, as identified by Sheriff Principal Taylor, Solicitors are unlikely to run cases which have little chance of success. And on a no-win, no-fee basis, they are unlikely to be paid. Second, uh, we will see the regulation of claims management companies in Scotland, which will discourage unscrupulous claims management companies operating north of the border. Third, the compulsory pre-action protocol, which was introduced in the Sheriff Court for personal injury actions involving claims of under £25,000, will act to identify at an early stage claims which have no merit. And finally, the provision in Section 8, Subsection 4 of the Bill that the benefit of quarks may be lost if the pursuer behaves inappropriately will also discourage vexatious claims being raised. The Scottish Civil Justice Council has confirmed in its plan of work for the coming year that it will prioritise implementation of the bill, therefore looking at important issues of uh, what happens in circumstances where the case is summarily dismissed, abandoned or where a pursuer fails to beat a tender, all issues that were raised during the consideration of the bill. On the important issue of third party funding, uh, it was never the intention to see trade unions uh, uh, facing an award of expenses against them when they acted as funder uh, and we have uh, seen amendments to uh, absolutely put that beyond doubt. 
on the important issue of auditors of court. Uh, we will see uh, changes to the system, but we will uh, anticipate also transitional arrangements to deal with those who are currently uh, in post. Uh, uh, the government's amendments on the group proceeding procedure at stage three will permit the Scottish Civil Justice Council to prioritise, if it so wishes, rules on opt-in procedure. Uh, and in so doing, they may wish to look at the draft act of sederent produced by the Scottish uh, Law Commission some time ago. And the government will also provide the council with the policy note on what it considers is required for rules on opt-in. And that hopefully will facilitate uh, expeditious uh, action. In summary, presiding officer, this bill will directly enhance the ability of people in Scotland who have a meritorious civil claim to pursue that case in the courts. It seeks to remove some of the barriers which in the past have deterred individuals from accessing justice in the civil courts. It extends the funding options for individuals and clarifies how much it will cost to enter into a success fee agreement. It makes clear that a pursuer will not become liable for the cost of the defender if a personal injury case is lost. The bill also addresses concerns about transparency of the work of auditors of court who currently derive a private income from what is in effect a public office. And finally, the bill will indeed lead to the introduction of group proceedings in Scotland for the first time. Presiding officer, I would like to repeat my thanks to all of those who gave evidence to help improve the bill during its parliamentary process. And I commend the motion in my name. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. That concludes our stage three proceedings. We turn straight to decision time. And the first question is that amendment 11967.2 in the name of Brian Whittle, which seeks to amend motion 11967 in the name of Aileen Campbell on success of the Commonwealth Games be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 11967.1 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Aileen Campbell be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 11967 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended on the success of the Commonwealth Games be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Now the fourth question is on stage three of a bill and so we will uh, formally cast our votes. The question is that motion 11829 in the name of Annabel Ewing on stage three of the civil litigation expenses and group proceedings Scotland bill be agreed and members should cast their votes now. Thank you. And the result of the vote on motion 11829 in the name of Annabel Ewing is there are 115 yes votes. That is unanimous. The motion is therefore agreed and the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill is passed. <laughs> we'll now move on to members' business in the name of Kezia Dugdale on support for rape crisis centres. We'll just take a few moments for the members uh, and the law officers to take their seats.